Uh, if, if you don't know me, my name's Gary Smith, and uh, Dr. McIntyre is usually in this class, but he's off gallivanting around on vacation somewhere. I forgot where. No, I'm just kidding. He's visiting his grandkids, and, and uh, he, I think he might be back a few weeks in August, but I'm not sure when. So I'm going to text him this week and see when he's coming back. I think he might be back next week, but I'm not sure. But anyway, next week, when next week comes around, if, I, if he's not back, I'll be here. That's good. Yeah. If he's back, I won't be here. It's really kind of that simple. Anyway, uh, have we heard any, any uh, late, re I mean, uh, recent reports for Pastor Ted and Phyllis? I talked to them Thursday. Thursday? How are they doing? They're doing good. They're having fun. Good, good. Same thing. Tell everybody hi. Tell everybody hi. Okay. Hey, Pastor Ted, Phyllis. Yeah, it's. I'm glad they're having a good time. Well, we're going to be uh, looking, continuing in our book for Sunday school, which is called Foundations: Bible Truths for Christian Growth. And we're, we've been using this for several months, and going to use it until the end of of the year through December, I guess. And uh, so what we've been looking at over the last several weeks has been uh, the chapter about the church. And so last week we started looking at um, on page, well, uh, we, we looked at one of the verses and on page 123, which is Acts 2.42. And so on page 123 in Acts 2.42, which says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And so uh, it, the book kind of broke down the verse and on 123 towards the top, it has number one, it says the apostles and it's referring to the doctrine and fellowship. And, and so there's an emphasis in the church that we are we want to continue in our church, which is uh, being concerned about doctrine, being, you know, studying and proclaiming the Word of God. So we're going to pick it up from there. And uh, but let's first let's have a word of prayer. Does anybody have a prayer request before we get started? No. Okay. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for this day. Um, thank you for each person that's here today, and we just uh, pray that as we look into your word that you would bless us and uh, the Holy Spirit would speak to us and that we would learn more about your word today and we'd be able to apply it and uh, be more effective in our ministry to others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, does the microphone bother anybody? Is it too loud for you? Is there like a ringing or a pinging? No? Okay. It's probably all up in my head. But that's okay. So the first point uh, with reference to Acts 2.42 is talking about the Apostles' Doctrine. And then number two, there's a blank in, in the book, and we've, we talked about fellowship. And under that it says the Greek word used here is koinonia. In addition to godly friendships, it literally means to have things in common. So we, we looked at some verses with regard to that. And, uh, but the nice thing that we have in common when we come to church, uh, if you're a believer and I'm a believer, we're both believers in Jesus Christ. We have the, what's in common is we have fellowship in Jesus Christ. We're in God's family. And so that's a great thing to have. And uh, in our, ch our church, our church is a body of believers. So, you know, if you're an only child, guess what? You have a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ. So <laughs> we're in a big family. And uh, of course, you know, in families, we, you know, there, there are family situations. Uh, sometimes we don't agree with each other, but you know, the bottom line is we're a family. So we, we need to work that out. Um, when I was growing up, for some reason, my brother liked to punch me every day. Because um, he was, <laughs> this is what older brothers do, I guess. I don't know. Uh, we get along really well. He doesn't punch me anymore. I'm really thankful for that. Um, so, you know, in the family, there's, you know, some kinds of disagreements. In our church family, sometimes we have disagreements, but we, we need to work those out as a family uh, in our church and have unity. And so that kind of brings us to the top of 124. And number three, 
Uh, it says breaking of, and if you look at Acts 2.42, what do you think this, the blank is supposed to be? Breaking of bread. That's right, breaking of bread. And this is referring to the Lord's table when we have communion uh, once a month. We usually have it once a month, first Sunday in, in each month. And, you know, we uh, talk about the elements of the Lord's table, the, the bread, which represents the, the body of Jesus Christ and the the um, grape juice, which is the, represents the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're supposed to do that in remembrance of him. And then number four, from looking at Acts 2.42, the breaking of bread and in, what should, what should be in the blank there? Prayer. Prayer, prayer, sure. So when we, when we come to our church, uh, in our services, we should have times of prayer and we, we actually Wednesday night is kind of devoted for prayer meeting uh, we do have a message the pastor gives us a message but then also we have a time where we can look at prayer requests uh, from people in our church and we pray about those and and that's good that's we should pray for each other uplift each other in prayer now as you can see the the focus in Acts 242 these four areas you know, the doctrine, the fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer. And there's a little paragraph underneath number four at the top of 124. Let me read that and then make some comments about it. It says, notice that the focus of all these activities is either God or his people. What is striking in its, ap what is striking in its absence? And it says evangelism. And it says how interesting this is considering the fact that Many modern churches going to, great, going to great extremes to make the unchurched feel at home and in, in their services. Unfortunately, their efforts are spiritually ineffective and biblically indefensible. Worship services are for worship, not evangelism. And then it says it, it has been well said that the church gathers for worship and scatters for, for evangelism. Well... When I read that the first couple times, it kind of, I kind of took that wrong, and it kind of bothered me. But I think I understand what they're saying, is that as we've been studying, you know, uh, God established the church for, for God's people, so a believers, for edification and for fellowship. Um, I think what they're trying to say is that, you know, some churches, and they use the term modern churches, uh, they're trying to they're trying to bring in the lost, and that's good. We should, you know, bring in the lost and evangelize. But the if it's out of balance, then that's that's the part that could be you know maybe off. You might say, and that you know our church, uh, if if someone's a believer, then that makes them a, a member of the body of Christ. So what's our focus for our church? Well. We do try to evangelize uh, by, you know, giving to, to missions um, and by having services that have invitations. But if, if our whole purpose is to evangelize the lost, what about the believers? You see, so it, there has to be a balance there. So I kind of, that, I was thinking about that this week and thought, yeah. But it makes sense. I, I understand what you're trying to say, but I don't know, maybe, um, did you take it that way or, or is it just me? Did you feel it was, a, it was a kind of a weird approach that they took on that paragraph? Okay, so I was just the one that was thinking about it. Okay, well let's look at the next part which is the bottom half of 124. It says appreciating the local church. And it says, as you can tell, scripture has much to say about the local church. The lack of emphasis placed on local church ministry today is in stark contrast to the great emphasis the church receives in scripture. There are several reasons why you must value the local church. Okay, and then they say, number one, the local church is central in the New Testament writings. And then it goes on to say that first bullet at the bottom of 124 it says, the book of Acts tells of the founding and activity of the first generation of local churches. So let's go to the top of 125. It says, much of the New Testament was written to specific local churches, Romans 1 and 2, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, 
Colossians 1 and 2, I'm sorry, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 2 John and Revelation. And then also several books were written to the leaders of specific local churches. And 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, 3 and 3 John. And then several of the books already mentioned focus on the church as their main topic, especially Ephesians, Colossians, and Paul's letters to Timothy. So I think they're making a point here is that, you know, in the scriptures, it definitely talks about the local church. And then number two, it says in the middle of 125, it says the local church is central in God's plan for his work. It says the local church is key to Christ's great promise in Matthew 16, 18. And as we discussed before, but let's just go back to Matthew 16 and 18, Matthew 16, 18, and just review that verse. If you like to turn back, if you don't, it's okay, I'll just read it. Matthew 16, 16 and verse 18 says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So this is Jesus talking. Um, he had just asked the disciples in verse 15, uh, But whom say ye that I am? And then Peter, he's, he confessed that in verse 16 he says, Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. And so you see that confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's the basis of our church. That's the rock that we build our church on, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is what we build our church on. And it's his church, as we talked about before. And Jesus himself said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So nothing's gonna stop the building of the church and the church moving and growing and expanding. It's God's church and he's gonna make that happen. Um, even though we know that Satan and evil forces are against it, um, the bottom line is God's for it and he's gonna make sure it goes, continues. So he's gonna use us in that effort as believers in the local church. Okay, so back to, to page 125 towards the bottom, it says the local church is the key to God's to Christ's great command in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. So you probably have memorized these verses I have, but I'm gonna to turn to it anyway, just in case I forget a word or something. <laughs> but Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, bless you. This is what we would call the Great Commission, and Jesus is speaking here, verses uh, 19 and 20. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy, Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So Jesus is saying to his disciples, Go, go, make disciples, go, teach all nations, go everywhere. Teach about me. Teach what I've commanded. And, but then there's a promise too in verse 20. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So, yeah, we have a big job to do. We have to, you know, spread the gospel. But God promises that he's going to be with us. He's going to help us. He's going to support us. He's going to enable us to do his work. And so that's what's exciting about it. Because sometimes I think... You know, I'm trying to serve the Lord, and I think, you know, God, I really don't have that much to offer. <laughs> and he's like, uh, yeah, I know, but I'm going to use you anyway. <laughs> so I'm glad for that. I'm thankful that he uses me anyway, even though I don't have a lot to offer. But he wants to use what we have, whatever our gifts and abilities are. And then also, if we look into Mark 16, verse 15, let's see what that verse says probably similar to Matthew 28. Matthew 16 and verse 15, Jesus is speaking, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's pretty clear, right? Go everywhere, teach everyone the gospel. It's very simple, what's the gospel? It's the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know? 
If, we, if Jesus didn't raise himself from the dead, our, our faith would be in vain. That's what the scripture says. So, you know, we serve a risen Savior. That's what the song says. One of the hymns that we sing. We serve a risen Savior. You know, we serve a living God. Jesus Christ is alive. He's sitting on the right hand of the Father in heaven. And, but we have a job to do. You know, until he says the end. <laughs> until he calls us home or in case, in, unless there's the rapture, we just have to keep on going and keep spreading the gospel. And then also in Luke, let's look in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, and it says 46 to 68, um, but I don't think there's 68 verses in chapter 24. There's only 53. So I don't know where the other verses, I think it was just the typo, I'm, I'm teasing here. But let's, let's read, if you follow along with me, in Luke 24 verses 46 to 53. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send, you, send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Wouldn't it have been great if we would have been living back in Jesus' time and maybe even have been a disciple of Christ and been with him every day and heard his teachings, and then he commissioned us to go out and spread the gospel. That would have been really neat. Um, well, unfortunately, we didn't live back then. <coughs> Excuse me. But he still commissioned us to go out and spread the gospel. It's our, it's our duty, as we've seen in these, in these passages. And then also, let's look in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And Jesus is speaking, he says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is, is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and into the uttermost part of the earth. So Jesus is saying, you're going to receive power. And what's that power? Who's, who's going to give you that power? After Jesus resurrected, he sends somebody to be with each believer. Who's that? Yeah, the Holy Spirit. So you might be thinking, wow, you know, it's, uh, I'm kind of afraid to spread the gospel and talk to people. Well, you're not alone. The Holy Spirit will empower you. The Holy Spirit will be with you and help you. And uh, I've prayed many times, like when I'm trying to witness to someone, and said, Lord, I don't know what to say. You know, can you help me here? <laughs> and somehow he gives me the words and the, the verses to share and... Um, yeah, because the Holy Spirit can work through us. He can, he can give us those words that we need to share when we're, when we're spreading the gospel. He's there to help us. He's always there to help us. So also at the bottom of 125, after, after those verses that we just read, it says, although the first emphasis of the Great Commission is evangelism, the second is intense edification, <clears throat> which requires the local church. What specific command does Christ give in Matthew 28, 20? Well, we've already read that, but does anybody remember from the verse? 28, 20? Okay. Observe all things. Yeah, what about the three words before that? before to observe all things. The three words before that. Man. Teaching them. Teaching them. Yeah. Sorry, I was going for the obvious there. Teaching, teaching, teaching. Yeah, that's our job here at the church. Teach. The, the pastor, when he gets up and opens the word with us, he's teaching us God's word. When the Sunday school class is right now, we're in Sunday school class, 
If you go over into the Sunday school classes where the, where the children are, teachers up there teaching, what are they teaching? God's Word. Have you ever gone to a church and, and they're talking about stuff, but it isn't really about God's Word? I remember my mother, when, uh, when I was 10, she was taking us to these different churches. She was looking for a church for us to go to. And she went to one particular church. They never really talked about the Bible very much or the gospel, and we didn't stay there. I'm glad. You know, we went to a we went to a Baptist church in South St. Pete in Gulfport, actually, and um, it was an independent Bible-believing church, Calvary Baptist Church in Gulfport, and uh, and I'm glad that we went there because uh, every service the pastor taught the Word of God, and in Sunday school we learned about the Word of God, and I grew up learning about God's Word, which was very helpful. And that's, that's the purpose of church, is to teach. Teach, to decide, make disciples. And so that involves teaching. And then also at the bottom it says, what does fulfilling that command require the local church? Requ require the local church. Well, anybody have an answer for that? What does it require? Well, probably you have to be there. <laughs> Some, pe some people might think, well, I, you know, yeah, I go to church on Easter and Christmas. You know, that's enough. Some people, I guess, think that way. Um, I think we need more than that, you know. Um, the scripture does say in Hebrews 10, 25, it says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together with believers. So, you know, it's important for us to, to come to church so that we can have fellowship and we can be taught and uh, it's important that we don't get in a, uh, in a mindset that we don't really want to go to church. There are some people, uh, maybe they've been hurt or something happened and maybe somebody disappointed them in church and, and they feel like, eh, I don't want to go back there. You know. um, actually, my brother is kind of in that category. He, he had uh, some kind of an ex bad experience, and and so he doesn't. He stopped going to a, the church that he was going to, and he hasn't really committed to any specific church since then. And I I don't talk with him about it a lot, but I say, you know, okay, well, you're not going to that church. Well, find another church that you want to be a part of, another local church. And uh, but some people, you know, they're in that situation. They've been hurt and and they don't feel like they need to reconnect. But the scripture really tells us to do that because we need fellowship of other believers. We need that constant teaching of the scripture to help us grow and to help us you know, stay on track in our Christian life. Okay, let's look at the top of 126. It says, the book of Acts records the early church fulfillment of the Great Commission, especially tracing the ministry of the Apostle Paul. It says, Paul's missionary journeys especially highlight the importance of the local church. Everywhere the gospel went in the first century, the result was the establishment of a local church. And there's that little box in gray. It says, there's a principle there. It says, the local church is God's tool for working in this present age. You know, that's very true. God established the church. It's, it's, his, it's, it's his body that he wants us to do his work. You know, he's, he's doing it through us. And so the local church is very important. And we need, to, we need to be a part of it. We need to support it and help it and to use our talents and abilities in the church. Okay, the next part on page 126 at the top says submitting to the local church. And we're gonna look at some verses here that relate to that. Uh, under that, it says, Scripture clearly commands every believer to submit to the local church. Unfortunately, many believers have fallen into one of two ditches. Some reject biblical authority altogether. Others confuse a mindless cult-like gullibility with biblical submission. Both extremes are dangerous. As is often the case, the truth lies in the middle. Let's consider what the Scripture says about leadership within the local church. And then it goes on to say, there are two primary reasons for submitting to the local church leadership. Number one, God has instituted the local church. 
And it goes on to say, during God's dealing with humanity, he has established three institutions which he intends to minister to men on his behalf. God ordained the first human institution shortly after creation, the family. And scripture records God's institution of the family in Genesis, tw Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. The second human institution established by God was government. God granted humanity the authority to govern itself in Genesis 9, 6. The final human institution established by God is the local church. And then there's the question here, how does God command children to relate to their parents, the first human institution? So let's look in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, and we'll see what the answer is for that. You probably have already guessed it, but let's read the verse anyway. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So the question again, um, how does God command children to relate to their parents? Anybody? Starts with an O. Okay, honor and obey. So children are to obey their parents, obey. So the first institution, children are to obey their, their parents, the family. And then the next one says, how does God command you to relate to government, which is the second human institution? And so if you would turn back to Romans chapter 13, verse one, this is a classic verse, which talks about government. It says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So this is saying that government is ordained of God. And so what should our response be? Obey, Obey. be subject to. So, you know, the law enforcement, the police officer, the sheriff, what should we do? We should obey the law. <laughs> there is a law of the land, we should obey it. You know, when we're driving down the road in a 40 mile per hour zone, is it okay to go 70? No, um, you, might, you might get away with it, but if you get pulled over, you're probably gonna get a ticket and the sheriff or the officer, they have every right to give it to you because you broke the law. When I was younger, I used to try to talk my way out of tickets. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Um, but the truth was, I deserved every ticket I got because I was breaking the law. And uh, I just didn't want to pay the fine, but nevertheless, it was the law and I needed to be subject to it. So I, I try to do a better job of following the speed limit. And Lynn helps me, because when she's sitting next to me, if I start going too fast, she's like, go to the speed limit. You know? <laughs> sometimes I'm not paying attention. It probably doesn't happen to you, right? Yeah. But you know, why do they make roads that are like, if you go in Pinellas County, there's a road called Racetrack Road. What's that all about? You know, it says right there, racetrack. I guess it's because there's a racetrack on it. Oh, anyway, it's not giving me permission. Let's look at this next one. How does God command you to relate to the church, the third human institution? Well, let's look in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse seven, see what the answer is. Hebrews 13, verse seven. If you have it, why don't you go ahead and read it for us. Hebrews 13, verse seven. Anybody? Okay, thank you. I like the way they word this. Remember them which have rule over you. Um, in my, in my, uh, my Ryrie study Bible, there's a footnote for verse seven, and it says, though these leaders had likely died, their example should still be imitated. Um, the people that have rule over you, like who would that, who would that be in our, in our church? Who would the leaders be in our church? Can you name those positions? The pastor, elders, deacons. 
anyone that's in authority at the church, we should, it says, remember them. Remember them that have rule over you. And then I like the way that, I like this phrase, who have spoken unto you the word of God. That's what we have in common, the word of God. So we're all here, a body of believers. What do we have in common? The word of God, salvation, believers in Christ. Well, certain things have to be done. You know, certain things in the church have to be done. They have to be done a certain way, an orderly way, you know, decent way, according to the scripture. So we have leadership to help us accomplish these things in the, the right way. So what's our response? What should it be? Um, and at the end of the verse, it says, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. So I think the key word is follow. Now, sometimes in churches, some people in leadership, um, they go a little bit too far. And the scripture does teach that, you know, the leadership in a church shouldn't lord over lord over other people you know um be bossy you know we, we you know we're believers we we share the love of christ you know we can we can accomplish things by you know working with and talking with and you know working out situations with people instead of having an error you know if someone's arrogant and they're lording over i think that that's improper in in church leadership and, uh, and I, I don't think we have that here at all. And I, I really do not believe we have that here. I think pastor, he really demonstrates a, a humility uh, with, with all of us. And I really appreciate the way he, that he carries himself. Um, if you come here any day, usually he's, if he's walking around the church, he's singing. He's, sing, he's very happy. <laughs> I appreciate that. You know? and he's a very loving, kind person. And uh, the way he talks to people, I think, is really great. And I, I really appreciate the, his attitude. And I think he demonstrates that. So, you know, what should my response be to pastor? I want to follow him. Yeah. Pastor has a lot of great ideas for our church. I want to follow him. I think, he's, I think he's right. I think he has a good direction, a good vision. And I want to follow along with those ideas. And I, I think... The scripture is teaching the same kind of attitude, you know, the way that we follow, and that should be our response. So then the little paragraph under, underneath that Hebrews 13, 7 part says, it's worth noting that one of the first steps to submitting to the leadership of the local church is becoming an active member. Membership is an expression of like-mindedness and support, but also of submission to your God ordained authority. Okay, so let's look at some of these scriptures that relate to that. And number two says, God has ordained spiritual leadership within the local church. And God has established a system of human leadership within the local church. A thorough treatment of church government is not possible in this brief study. However, the following texts give some basic instructions regarding leadership in the church. So let's look in Mark chapter 10, and we'll look at verses 42 through 45, if you want to turn to that. Mark chapter 10. Let's take a look at these verses and see what they say about the church or about leadership. Okay, verses 42 to 45. And Jesus, but, I'm sorry, but Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye, ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it, but so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whoever, whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. And listen to this verse, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So what's Jesus talking about here? He's really talking about servant leadership. Hey, you want to be a leader? Be a servant. <laughs> that's, you know, that's kind of opposite of what 
you know, some people think about leadership. Oh, I'm supposed to, you know, I'm in charge of them. I, I get to tell them what to do. Uh, Jesus said, you want to be chiefest? Be servant to all. So what should our attitude be when we're here at church, when, when we're serving the Lord? We're ministering. We're servants. We're, ser we're serving others. Uh, I actually like what the law enforcement say, says on, the, on their vehicles. It says, to serve and protect. Have you ever seen that on some of the vehicles? It says, to serve and protect. I like that. And I think that's, that should be our motto, too, to serve, to serve, give service to others, you know, in our church. And so um, it, if we have that attitude, I think it puts a whole new meaning on the way that we serve the Lord. We're serving others, you know. Okay, so, okay, I'm in charge of something. Well, that's great. Good for me. But my purpose of being in charge of something is to serve the body of believers, you see. And, and doing that is then giving glory to the Lord, and, and I'm really serving God. And uh, not only that, but Jesus gave the perfect example. Remember when he washed the disciples' feet? He was the master. He had every right to say, hey, I'm the son of God. Wash my feet. What did he do instead? He washed their feet. He was showing them this is how we should serve. We should serve others. Uh, Lynn and I had the privilege of going on uh, many missions trips to Clearwater Christian. And uh, what we used to tell the team, the college students, uh, and they were, they were very dynamic and they were very energetic, but we'd say, hey, listen, you know, remember this verse in Mark. You know, that uh, Jesus said, for even the Son of Man came to, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. So we tell him, you know, when we're going to go to China or when we're going to go to Africa or wherever where we're going, you know, remember, don't go there and expect everybody to be bowing and, you know, serving you because you're, you know, you're here on this mission trip. Instead, turn it around and serve others. Demonstrate your service to others. And so we tried to do that, and, and I think when we, when we did that, I think we were successful. We were, in obey, we were obeying the Lord. Okay, let's look at another passage here. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, if you want to turn over to that passage, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. It says, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to uh, usurp authority over a man, but to be in silence. Okay, so um, this might not be a very popular verse nowadays, but I think the scripture is teaching here that, um, you know, God is using male leadership. You know, it, it kind of bothers me when I see uh, on TV these, uh, like weddings or, well, maybe not weddings, but churches that have female pastors. And maybe you have a different view about that. But, um, you know, in Timothy, Paul does talk to Timothy about, you know, bishops and deacons and elders and uh, the pastor. And, you know, it's, it's male leadership. And I know that's not popular these days and probably if if there were a lot of people in this, in, in our sanctuary that were unsaved, I probably would, people would be throwing things at me by now. <laughs> but that's what the scripture teaches. You know? So that's what we have to read. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, it talks about that God has ordained qualified and spiritual leadership. So let's look at these verses in 1 Timothy chapter 3. It says, this is the true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good thing. I'm sorry, a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Okay, now let me just, that refers to the previous verse, you know. How can you be a husband of one wife if you're not a man? That's what it says. That's what the scripture says. Uh, Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filth, filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covet, covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? That's a good question. Not a novice, 
lest being lifted up with pride he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use use the office of a deacon, be found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be husband of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So it's talking about qualified spiritual leadership, which we should have in the church. I think we're gonna to have to stop at this point. So next week, uh, whether I'm teaching or Dr. McIntyre, if he's back, we'll be starting at the t top of page 128. So let's have a closing. Oh, Art, go ahead. I think that we should honor our teacher on his birthday. You, me? <laughs> You're talking about me? Oh, yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's my birthday. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. At the stroke of midnight, I turned 65 years old. I know, and I have, and I can show you from my wallet. I have an. AARP card now, so I am official, okay? I'm 65. <laughs> so let's have a closing word of prayer. Thank you, Art. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your blessings to us, and thank you for the verses that we've talked about regarding the church, and help us to do our part, Lord, to build this body of believers and to see the gospel spread. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.